Yesterday's concert is a Flaming Handshake Media production. I've seen them. I've got that on you. The man jumped out of his seat, his accusational finger inches from my face. In any other scenario, his action would have been grounds for a more confrontational response. Instead, I eased back in my chair and laughed at his hysterics. Tonight, this was a friendly conversation that had turned theatrical pissing match. It was April 2013, and I was waiting for the Dave Matthews Band to take the stage at Oak Mountain Amphitheater just outside of Birmingham, Alabama. My seatmates, a friendly middle-aged couple from the area, were using the concert as an opportunity to get away from their kids for a date night. What started as an amicable conversation about the upcoming show slipped into a back and forth with the husband. Meanwhile, as the two man-child sparred, the guy's wife sat between us quietly sipping her wine. All right, all right, but who tops your list then? There's got to be somebody you haven't seen yet. He asked me. Well, yeah, there's, there's plenty of people on my bucket list, but Pearl Jam is probably my favorite band that I haven't seen yet. His response was totally innocent, perhaps slightly enunciated by his inebriation, and if nothing else, a good laugh at his wife's embarrassment as she tried to get him to sit down. But I was jealous of the guy. Super jealous, in fact. It didn't help that he saw them in 98 on their Yield tour. On the outside, I laughed and joked about it. He got me. He had this one on me. But lots of other people do too. I never saw Hendrix or Zeppelin and plenty of people have seen them. Granted, one's been dead longer than I've been alive and the other disbanded before my conception, but that doesn't change the fact that I haven't seen them and plenty of people have. But this guy's response triggered me. It sat with me for days. The moment echoed. His words played on repeat. I've seen them. I've seen them. I've got that on I've seen them. I've seen them. I've got that on like a buck in mating season, it evoked a territorial response. I took personal offense that someone had seen a band that I'd never seen before. Yes, it was an ugly response, but an honest emotion. At its root, it was just jealousy. Although this is a story for another day, since 2008, I'd gone to ridiculous lengths to see the Dave Matthews Band. But what about the other artists I loved? What efforts was I putting into seeing them? I claimed to love Pearl Jam, a top five favorite band. But how many times have I seen them live? As my new friend had so loudly reminded me, none. I've seen them. I've got that. Welcome concert goers, music fanatics, and better men. My name is Lance Ingram, and in this season one, episode five of yesterday's concert, our jam journal takes us to October 14th, 2014. Grab your earplugs as we go to the FedEx Forum in Memphis, Tennessee for Pearl Jam. Frustration swept over me like a volcano terrorizing a small town. My brow tightened, my fist curled, and I stomped the ground for good measure to complete the temper tantrum. Hold it back. Let's try it one more time. We'll get it right eventually. Once I hit play, there wasn't a second to compose myself. The song is a kick in the face the moment the clock starts. Moving faster than my brain could process, my hands scrambled to keep up. The rhythm didn't even matter at this point. I just wanted to land the notes. But even with my best efforts put forward, I barely made it 10 seconds before I was dismantled by another flubbed attempt. I'd been at this for days, why couldn't I get this right? Angered to the point of profanity, I tossed the instrument on my bed, watching its black body land in a heap of frustration and broken dreams. Truthfully, I don't know what I expected. I'd only been learning the guitar for a couple months, weeks really, yet nothing I played sounded remotely like the song. Why was I even trying to learn this song? If I was honest with myself, I knew I didn't actually like it. I was just posturing for some imaginary rock and roll jury. This song was a classic rock radio staple, which meant I was supposed to like it, right? What kind of young rock starter didn't love the classics? My left hand gripped the neck and brought the instrument back into position. The body hung low, below my belt line, because that's how the cool guys wear it. My fingers jumped like clunky dancers through a warm-up scale while my eyes followed their every move. Slowing it down and bypassing the rhythm again, I plucked out the notes and tried to reassure myself that I could do this. My fingers warm, my brain reset, I pressed play on my stereo again. The song was Pearl Jam's classic hit, Evenflow. One more time, the song's instantaneous fury start sent my hands scrambling. 
My index finger slid up the low E, landing on the seventh. My index struggling to reach back to the third. I used my ring finger to hammer on the fifth, a new technique I'd spent my last guitar lesson learning about. Tiny calluses did nothing to protect my fingers from the smattering. I could feel myself losing pace again. I knew I was at least a half step behind the groove and after flubbing another hammer on, I ripped the instrument off my shoulder. A jumbled noise of force and feedback bled through the tiny amplifier as the guitar landed on the floor. This was so stupid. The song is overrated and Tin's not even that good of an album. An album. Before we get too far into the story, you'd probably like for me to address that statement. Some might say it's rock and roll heresy. So let's talk about the seminal Pearl Jam album, Ten. The true father of modern rock and an album that paved the way for grunge music to change the world. One of the best-selling albums of the 90s, a true milestone in rock catalogs that's mentioned with reckless abandon on every quote-unquote greatest albums list ever. Thing is, it didn't do a whole lot for me. As an up-and-coming rocker, a teenager obsessed with what classic rock radio told me to like, it still stumps me that 10 never grabbed me earlier. Heavy riffage, guitar solos galore, and that Eddie Vedder growl that perfectly encapsulates pubescent indignation. This was right up my angsty teenage rock and roll alley. I was supposed to like this stuff, right? Instead, I found the album boring, and even slightly bloated. Some songs like Deep, Even Flow, and Why Go were heavy enough with the rock riffage, but songs like Once, Black, Oceans, Garden, and Release were, were too soft and emotionally in touch to satiate my up-tempo young rocker taste. Even a hit like Alive, which, despite the killer intro, was way too mid-tempo for someone who preferred double bass drum and heavy metal thunder. As a teenager in the early 2000s, I was still new to rock and roll music. Coming up, I was listening to the music that had defined generations. Kids had lived and died by these songs. I was convinced that if I was ever going to earn respect to my own musical aspirations, I had to entertain nearly four decades worth of music to earn my merits. What kind of guitarist would I be if I didn't know how to play Day Trip or Smoke on the Water or Even Flow? I was on a mad scramble to catch up on the back catalog of rock's most legendary songs. And this epic quest was life-giving. It gave me an identity not only as a musician, but as a music fanatic. New bands were popping up on my radar every day. I was hearing Nirvana for the first time. Do you remember hearing Nirvana for the first time? That visceral emotion when all your innocence and naivety leaves your soul while you thrash around your bedroom to smells like teen spirit? That was my first true step into adulthood. Even though Nirvana was no stranger to rock radio, they always felt like something greater than what Top 40 hits had to offer. Yeah, Teen Spirit's cool and all, but have you ever heard radio-friendly Unit Shifter? Then there was Pearl Jam. I'd heard about Pearl Jam in every single conversation with Nirvana. They were mentioned on every VH1 rock special. Online forums raved about Pearl Jam. It was, it was always Jeremy this or even Flo that. The music world seemed obsessed with Pearl Jam, especially the album 10. It was like it was the sole title in their discography. The radio never played anything from their other albums. Dave DeVarro never mentioned Yellow Leadbetter in his countdown of the top rock songs of the 90s. If you didn't like 10, you didn't like Pearl Jam, which in my brain meant you didn't like rock music. I battled with this for years. I listened over and over, always hoping something would finally grab me. But instead it left me wondering what was wrong with me when I still didn't love it. Then in 2006, Pearl Jam released a new album. Mostly out of curiosity, I put 10 aside and gave the new album a chance. Driving around my small Mississippi town, I was introduced to something that finally clicked. This wasn't 10. This was a new experience, something made during and for my generation. Since the opening notes of Life Wasted, I'd been captivated. The songs were shorter, the guitar wasn't as distorted, and the lyrics weren't as angry. Yet somehow this was the Pearl Jam I'd been searching for. It was a beautiful clash of my generation and those that preceded it. When the CD finished and shuffled back to track one, the thought never crossed my mind to stop it. Avocado, as the fans lovingly nicknamed the self-titled album, owned my stereo for weeks. I couldn't take my ears away from these songs. Then I remembered Pearl Jam had an entire discography that I hadn't even tapped into yet. I found a copy of Yield and Vitalogy at the public library. A friend gave me by Norrell. I bought verses at the nearest Best Buy. These albums showed me a completely different side to Pearl Jam than what I'd heard on 10. Where 10 was an early 90s time capsule, the rest of the discography was where the band really shined. I fell in love with the odd and explorative rock of Vitalogy, the catchy hooks of Yield, and the outright aggression on my personal favorite verses. Every album was a unique approach by the band. Rather than rehashing Jeremy, their style shifted, taking new risk in an effort to distance themselves from the monster they had created. Gorging myself on the Pearl Jam discography happened within the span of about a week. 
but it was also the last time Pearl Jam wasn't one of my favorite bands. I've seen them. I've got that on. I've seen them. I've got that on. The howl of the overenthusiastic Dave Matthews fan rang in my head for weeks. I could still hear his cackle, feel the embarrassment of his wife and the shame of being got. I'd like to say he inspired me to immediately buy plane tickets to the next stop on Pearl Jam Tour, but sadly that wasn't the case. Thinking there's still plenty of time left to see them, I procrastinated. A dangerous dance for anything you love. Carpe diem, am I right? But Destiny took my considerations in its own hands, and less than a year later I was buying tickets to see Pearl Jam in Memphis. Even if it was a two-hour drive on a work night from where I was living in Tupelo, Mississippi, Memphis was close enough. You don't get to cross off bucket list items sitting at home. I bought the best ticket I could, a seat five rows off the floor, stage left, and I got there so early I ended up sitting there for two hours before the band ever stepped foot on the stage. I was that excited. And then the room goes black. A set of spotlights blare from the back of the stage, illuminating silhouettes of amplifiers and instruments like a big city skyline. A voice boomed over the audience. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Through a hazy navy light, the echoes of pendulum crept through the room. Ed grabbed both hands on the microphone, holding on for dear life and leaned into a crouch. The crowd, still reeling on pre-show jitters, jumped to their feet. The guitar wavers and bills, sending chills up my spine. The lights remain low. The song creeps forward. It wasn't the star anyone would have requested, but the track from their most recent album, Lightning Bolt, was received warmly. People clapped and cheered because the Pearl Jam faithful knew this was just the start. Without missing a beat, as Pendulum stopped swinging, the band rolled directly into an acoustic B-side. Wash, the flip side of Alive, was released during the peak of Tin Pandemonium. The overhead lights disappeared, casting the band in a blue haze. Even in my close approximation to the stage, I could barely make out the shifting figures. I should have been mad that I paid so much to see a largely dark stage, but those poorly illuminated shadows still sounded better than a lot of bands do in the brightest of lights. Speaking of lights, they followed Wash with Low Light, another acoustic track. We were almost 15 minutes into the show, and I hadn't heard a single distorted guitar or trademark Eddie Vedder growl. For a band that is commonly known as a pioneer of early 90s angry music, this was an unexpectedly mellow start. But this was a promotional tour after all. I expected a heavy hand in new tracks, but this was Pearl Jam, and Pearl Jam knows their audience better than most. It may have been a mellow start with a new track and two low-key deep tracks, but the crowd hung on every second of it. And when the band did finally stomp on the distortion and went pedal to the metal with the crowd favorite Wygo, it was exactly how I imagined Pearl Jam shows. Men pounded their chests, beers took to the sky, the lyrics were growled out like teenage boys psyching themselves up before the regional football championship in 1992. Since that fateful week I became a fan, I spent the better part of the decade pouring over Pearl Jam bootlegs. My entire basis for live Pearl Jam was centered around legendary sets like Drop in the Park, Atlanta 94, State College 03, Benny Royal Hall, and even more recent shows like Chicago 2007 and Philadelphia 2013. I knew the chance of Memphis ever landing in a category with one of those shows was unlikely, but I'd be lying if I said those shows didn't frame my expectations for the evening. In the old days, I I could only see the first bit of people because usually in the smaller clubs, there'd be a lot of pot smoke so everyone looked pretty fuzzy, but now it's because my eyes are not working so well, Ed shared between songs. The audience laughed, but it was a reminder that this wasn't the same group of 20-year-old guys that instantly started mosh pits by banging out State of Love and Trust. They were older. Tamer. Their most recent album, Lightning Bolt, was a far cry from their best material. Still to this day, it's my least favorite Pearl Jam album. But I was going to see them regardless of the album they supported. As my Dave Matthews friend reminded me, I had already missed the Yield tour. But nothing could have kept me out of the room that night. I knew I'd have to endure new songs like Sirens, but I'd finally be able to hold my own accusational fingers. Alright, here's one that's almost as old as Ancient Greece, but playing it younger than ever, Mr. Mike McCready on guitar! The band exploded, the guitar slid down the neck and the crowd erupted. Played at breakneck speeds, the band was working overtime to keep the pace. With that opening slide of even flow, everyone was sent back to their own version of the old days, like Ed had just mentioned. 
I imagine my poor teenage fingers working to keep up with the supersonic speed of this version. I saw myself throwing my guitar in frustration that I couldn't keep up with Stone Gossard and Mike McCready. But as I watched Stone's hands slide up and down the neck, I couldn't resist pulling out my air guitar. This was my chance to shred along like I'd always dreamed of doing in my teenage bedroom. My hands slid through the air, my fingers ran imaginary scales. I was Eddie Van Halen without an ounce of skill. There wasn't a single note I hit correctly, but it finally felt great to be jamming along. After slamming the audience with the old school crowd favorite, the band tipped the scale back to their newest release, a one-two punch of lightning bolt and sirens. I've already made one jab at sirens, and I know it's not a popular opinion, so I'll just leave it at that, but that was my cue to hit the head. Convinced I could hold it when I heard the opening strums of that song, I knew 16-year-old Lance would forgive me for stepping away for the show for a few minutes. And I guess the band saw my cue because from there out, it was nothing but the good stuff. Nearing three hours long, the show was almost everything I could have asked for. A sleight of hand or a crown of thorns cover or even a dirty Frank bust out would have been nice, but that, that's irrelevant. Offering a career-spanning balance to their entire discography, it was heavy on the songs casual fans wanted to hear and coded with just enough deep tracks to satisfy the diehards. Even though Ed claimed he caught a cold in Austin the night before, it was undetectable in his performance. To step back and hear the audience sing the first verse of Better Man was something straight out of those magical bootlegs. Plus getting to hear my favorite songs like Wishless, Given to Fly, and Breath, well it's a moment of justice for a decade plus of fandom. I mentioned earlier how even going into the show I had tempered expectations. The band was aged, it was a promotional tour, and I was comparing my weeknight stop against some of the band's most legendary sets. I had set myself up to fail. To expect to be anywhere near that class is just naive. But there is this weird thing that happens when you listen back to bootlegs of your old shows. Either you're a little disappointed because it wasn't as good as you remember, maybe the vibe was stronger than the actual performance, or what can also happen is it's better than you remember. The distractions from the live setting don't deter your focus from the music. The bad songs are a little easier to overlook when you know the whole set list. Rather than groaning about another new track like the spoiled and entitled music fan I am, it's easy to know there's a killer performance of Porch coming up. This show falls very much into the Better With Age category. Since it was a promotional tour, it's no surprise they played too much from Lightning Bolt. But with time, the show has sounded better and better. It's often overshadowed by the following shows where the band played No Code and Yield in their entirety. But the band was very much on that night in Memphis. The setlist variety and performances are maybe not Atlanta 94, but it's a standout of the Lightning Bolt tour. Before leaving the stage for the final bow, Ed thanked us for filling up the room and said they hoped to return again. He may say it at every show, but listening to the show now, it feels very real. This may not have been a Madison Square Garden show, but it was my show. Who knows if I'll ever get to see them again. I had a ticket to their 2020 show in Nashville, but like every show that year, nature had a different plan. Regardless, Memphis 2014 is a show I can always look back on as a mile marker for completing a bucket list item, making good on someone else's challenge. But the thing is, even crossing off a major bucket list item wasn't the most memorable thing about that night. It's what happened after the show that made the night special. The asphalt was never ending. Winding curve or straightaway, it didn't matter. The road went on forever and the only thing that disturbed the monotonous drudge was the occasional explosion of bug guts on my windshield. Clouds remained from the day's showers and draped the night sky, leaving only the illuminating glow of the half moon. My headlights paved away like the original pioneers, providing the only source of light for grueling stretches at a time. At midnight, every tree and billboard begins to look the same at 80 miles an hour. Alone on the North Mississippi Highway, not another car in sight, the road's incessant roar penetrated every activity I devised to distract myself from the boredom. Post-show euphoria had started to fade, leaving me eager to be home and every minute left in the car more exhausted. Extended late-night post-show drives weren't new to my concert tandem, but doing so alone was. No matter how loud I turned up the music, the lonely drone of the road remained louder. It was like something straight out of a Bob Seger song. I turned the dial on my radio. The music cranked and rattled the plastic covers on my speakers. Even to be leaving a rock concert, the noise level was concerningly loud. The bass rattled my car like mortar fire. 
the high scream through my ears, scratching my brain. Alas, no Pantera song was loud enough to block this energy. It was time to face the music. Time to face my thoughts. The only thing that could distract my road-weary eyes was to get my mind moving, see what was lurking in all those crevices. Perhaps somewhere in all those thoughts and emotions I had been avoiding to protect my fragile male ego was something that could ward off this dreariness. I loved my girlfriend. Anna and I had been dating for about three years, and I had no doubt that she was the girl for me. But change can be scary. There were a lot of variables in our relationship. We were no longer next-door neighbors. Far from it, actually. She in Little Rock for grad school and me in Tupelo for my first job. Neither of us were in a position to pack up and start a new life. But it was time to be a man and make the decision. Are we going to make it through this? Sure, we could try to wait it out, but nothing had come easy in the first few months. How would another four years in a long-distance relationship go? I feared I knew what the answer would be if I really took time to think about it. That's probably why I tried not to. But like gasoline to fire, my mind exploded with ideas. The little light bulb popped on over my head and my decision had been made. I was going to propose to her. But not only that, I knew every single detail. I didn't have to map anything out. It was all there. Where I'd get the ring, where I'd do it, how I'd do it, everything. Even more than that, I knew how we'd make it through the next four years. The entire wedding timeline and all the minutiae was included. I was floored with the peace and the decision and what would have been months of planning came to me in literally seconds. I had a girl that men would go to war for, and then it was time to lock it down. On December 14th, 2014, two months from the day I saw Pearl Jam, those lightning bolt plans came to fruition. Standing beneath the chilly night sky, I dropped to one knee, pulled out my grandmother's ring, and through a dry and shaky voice asked the biggest question of my life, Anna, will you marry me? I owe a lot to Tim. Aside from catapulting one of my favorite bands from backroom bars to sold out stadiums, my inability to give up on that album led me to making one of the biggest and best decisions of my life. I likely would have kept kicking it down the road before she got tired of my indecisiveness and left me. Ten still isn't my favorite Pearl Jam album, and it took me listening to their entire discography before I finally got its significance. Had I not kept fighting to like that album, given Avocado a chance, been challenged to see them live finally, or actually make it to that show, I'm not sure I would have ended up popping the question. So for that, I have to say, thanks for being all right, Tim. I'm Lance Ingram, and this is Yesterday's Concert. Thanks for tuning in to another episode. Sources and more info on today's show are available on our website, yesterdaysconcert.com. While you're there, connect with Yesterday's Concert, sign up for our e-newsletter, or jump over to Facebook or Instagram and give us a shout, at Yesterday's Concert. And until next time... Take care of your shoes.